evening, everybody. Let's just take a moment to pray. We've been singing about the fact that He is here. And that we've been standing, as it were, in the presence of God. Those are like unbelievable words. Remember what happened to Moses when he saw that burning bush and became aware that this was God revealing himself and the Lord said, take off your shoes because the place you are standing is holy ground. And where I am, there is holiness and purity and righteousness. When Isaiah stood and, as it were, was, saw this vision of the Lord. And when he saw that vision, he was broken. He was a prophet, but he was broken. He became so aware of how unclean he was. He became so aware of the, that his nation was an unclean people. And everything that, the, that he says that, that, that we are a people of unclean lips. And he cries out, God, won't you touch me? And God takes a, as it were, there's a, a coal that's taken off the altar and touches his lips. And instead of burning him, it purifies him. And Isaiah's different because he's been with God. Father, I pray that as we meet and as we, as we look into your word tonight, that, that God, you would minister to us, that we may experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that there will be demonstrations of his power, that you will reveal yourself to us, God. For Father, we are not here for just for us. We are here for you and for what you have to say. Father, I pray that and take authority over any work of the enemy here tonight. We stand together. We take authority. We resist the enemy, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, you will know that we are, are in a series. We're going through right through the book of Genesis over the next, what's it, 15 weeks or something like that. So we're here for the long run. Uh, going through Genesis, there's been an introduction to Genesis um, Howard shared with us a little bit of the, about the meaning of Genesis, the genre of Genesis, uh, the poetic language that's used and the meaning that words have. And the important thing as we begin to read Genesis, it's about God and the greatness of God and what God has done. But I think for me, as we, as we go through Genesis, I want you to notice the tagline there because that tagline is quite critical. It's where faith and life intersect. We're not just wanting to read Genesis for the sake of having some knowledge of what's in Genesis. We want to discover how Genesis relates to our lives. Even although it was written such a long time ago, it's still relevant today, and it still has an impact on our lives, and our faith and life need to intersect, and they need to connect together. Now, about... I guess it maybe it's about six years ago, um, I was introduced to a course uh, that we now run uh, at Connect, and it's called the Living Free Course. Some of you uh, may know the course. Some of you, I think, have done the course. Put up your hand if you've done the course. Let me see. Oh, quite a few of you have done the course. And uh, for those of you who have done the course, you will know that one of the things that is highlighted in that course is the fact that there is an unseen realm or an invisible realm that is just as real as the seen realm, and that unseen realm is having an impact on our lives today. That unseen realm is having an impact on my life and your life. It's having an impact on people's lives around about us. It's having an impact on our nation. It's having an impact on our culture. It's having an impact even on the church today. And so we've got to take note of, of this unseen realm and the impact that it is having. On this course, one of the questions that you're taught to ask, which is really the title of my message, is this question, what's really going on here? 
What's happening around about me? Is this just something natural, or is there something greater behind this that is going on? For example, is this just a difficult situation that's happening, or is there something more going on? Is a strained strain marriage just one of those things that happen to people? Well, you know, all couples go through a strained marriage, so let's just accept that's part of life. Well, why does, why does selfishness and division rise up in the church? I mean, we all, or most of us, I trust, are, know the Lord, and, and we're trying to serve the Lord and be faithful to the Lord, and yet we still find division and, 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 and all of this kind of stuff it arises in the church. Where does that come from? Is a persistent lack of joy and zeal merely due to the fact that you've got a negative personality? And so, well, I'm just one of those negative people. I just tend to see things more negatively than positively. Is bad health something that's just happening? Are wars and famine just happening? Let, let me give you two quick examples of what I'm talking about from the Bible. How many of you remember the guy by the name of Job in the Old Testament? Some of you? More of you? Okay. And, and you remember that uh, if you looked at Job's life in the natural, he just seemed to have an incredibly bad run, didn't he? Uh, by the way, if anybody ever says to you, I'm having a Job experience, you need to really ask them whether they are having a, a Job experience. And remember the one thing for Job that where we are fortunate, Job didn't have the book of Job to read in what he was going through. He couldn't say, let me just check up what's really happening over here. He just had to live it out. But we've got the book of Job, and the book of Job reveals to us there was something going on behind the scenes. That Satan had come into the presence of God, and he'd said to the Lord, you know, Job only worships and prays you because you bless him. And God says, my people don't just praise me and worship me because I bless them. And, and in a sense, the enemy is given permission to go and test Job. And, and the goal of Satan over there is to get Job to deny God. And remember, he loses everything, including his health. Eventually, his wife says to him, curse God and die. His friends are saying to him, you know what your problem is? That you're sinning against God, and if you sort that out, everything will come right again. But God himself says to Satan, have you seen Job? He's the most righteous man around. And we recognize as we read the story of Job, there's more that's happening than what meets the eye. Another one, as you may not be so familiar with, is in 2 Kings chapter 6. And you've got the story of Elisha. You all remember Elijah? Well, Elisha was the prophet that followed him. And Elisha's in a city by the name of Dothan. And in the city, he's there with his servant. And the city had a wall around it because that's what they did for protection in those days. And the servant wakes up one morning. He goes to the city wall with his cup of coffee, hoping to have a look at the scenery. And he spots that there's a massive army that's surrounding the city. And guess who that army's after? Elisha and his servant. And he panics. And he goes to Elisha and he says, Elisha, have you seen what's going on outside over here? We're in severe trouble. And Elisha does something quite amazing. He says, Lord, why don't you just open his eyes for a moment? And God, for a moment, just opens Elisha's eyes, or rather his servant's eyes, and he sees something that up to then he hasn't seen. He sees the armies of heaven. And then he comes back and he says to Elisha, more are those who are for us than those who are against us. Isn't it interesting that once he saw what was happening in the unseen realm, all his fear disappeared? His whole approach to the situation changed because he saw what was happening in the unseen realm. Now, now when we come to Genesis chapter 3, we discover a bit of the answer to that question, so what's really going on over here? And you know Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter 3? It's a very well-known account of, of Adam and Eve and them disobeying God and the, the consequences of their actions. And we can read it as a story that was written thousands of years ago, or we can say, these things are still happening today. You see, when we, we come to Genesis chapter 3, we discover the answer to this question, 
What's really going on here? And the first thing that you discover when you ask that question is that the enemy is active and we need to take note of that. Uh, you, you, when you come to Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, you discover there's this perfect world that God has created. And in this perfect world, we are suddenly introduced to this other being. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning God. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, and the serpent was more crafty. Doesn't tell us where he come, came from, doesn't tell us anything about him. We're just suddenly introduced to this, this other being. And this other being is incredibly persuasive and incredibly persistent in his attempt to do two things. He wants to undermine the character of God, and he wants to create doubt about what God says. That's his goal. Remember, God had created everything, and when He created everything, He said it was not only good, but very good. He creates people, mankind, in His own image, and He gives them the responsibility to rule over everything that He has created. And the moment, and if you excuse the terminology, the talking snake, because that's how the Bible describes Him, or talking serpent, if you will, opens its mouth, it begins to stir up doubt about God's goodness and suggest that anything that God wants to do has anything, has, hasn't got our best interest at heart. God hasn't got our best interests at heart. So let's read it. Now the serpent was more crafty. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And the serpent said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? I mean, that is like a gross exaggeration of what God had said. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did, not, did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. And then blatantly the comeback. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, if you read a little bit further, he, he goes on to suggest there may be some benefit to be gained by disobeying God. Isn't it amazing that sin always seems to be so appealing? I don't know if you've ever found it, that when you're tempted to sin, it's always like this is going to be something great. This is going to be something good. In Genesis 3 verse 5, for, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Friends, we can't afford to underestimate the activity of the enemy in the world today. He is very real. And we cannot afford to ignore what is happening around us. You see, somewhere along the line, we are going to encounter the enemy. You're going to encounter the enemy. I have encountered the enemy. Remember, Adam and Eve encountered the enemy. Jesus encountered the enemy. The early church encountered the enemy, and we're going to encounter the enemy as well. That's why when Paul wrote to the Philippian church, and if you read Acts chapter 19, you get a little bit of an idea of what was happening. Uh, so not did I say Philippian. Um, Ephesian church. When he writes to the Ephesian church, we get a little bit of an idea of what was happening in there in Acts chapter 19. But um, if we can go to the next slide, please. For our struggle is not against. Why does he say that? Because it often seems as though our struggle is against flesh and blood. See, in the world that we live in, that's what it, the way that it appears. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. And here it is and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's the battle that we're involved in. When he wrote to the Corinthian believers in chapter 11, he says, 
Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. That means the devil kind of disguises himself. There's a, there's a disguise in his appearance and in what he says. The Apostle Peter, when he was writing to believers who were being persecuted for their faith, he says, be self-controlled and alert for your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And he's writing to believers. Jesus, uh, when he was speaking to his disciples in John chapter, uh, John chapter 10, yes, says the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. And the devil's way is always to get us to believe a lie to deceive us, and to create doubt about what we believe. Let me just pause there for a second. That's why at Connect Church, we are so concerned about what people are listening to, what they're reading, and what they're receiving. It's because we know that Satan comes as an angel of light and sometimes he's disguised as the most spiritual sounding person you could imagine. And sadly, there are Christians that have bought into stuff that I need to say is rubbish. Have you noticed how the media is portraying the enemy today? Have you noticed how many movies there are on the occult and the good witch? Didn't know that you got those two going together, but it seems like. And it's, it's, we get, we're getting desensitized all the time. It's getting downplayed. Have you, have you noticed in our culture how many people are saying that, that God is behind all the suffering and pain because he allows it? Have you ever had that question? How can you ask me to believe in God? After all, if He allows all this suffering and pain, you expect me to believe in somebody like that? If there, there's this insinuation, God is behind all the suffering and pain. What about the suggestion that our sinful actions won't have any serious consequences? That's cool. Just get on with it. Let me read to you two scriptures. They're not going to be on the screen, but let me read them to you. One is when Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in chapter 10. He said, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. They have divine power to demolish, and he uses a very interesting word, strongholds. He says we de demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. So he's talking about this. There's a spiritual battle that's going on. And he says out of the spiritual battle, there are strongholds that can develop. In Ephesians 4, he says this, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. That is written to Christians. In other words, there's a hint in Scripture that our conduct and what we believe can allow strongholds and footholds in our lives. It is a place where we are beginning to experience the attack of the enemy in our lives. But then Genesis goes on to talk about the way that Adam and Eve resort to dealing with what they have done when they disobey God. And I want you to notice how they disobeyed God, but I want you to also notice how they, they start to try and deal with this. I think what's helpful here is for, us to, for me to spend a few minutes talking about the ungodly choices we are tempted with because they are, sometimes they go far deeper than what we actually realize. Remember I said that the Bible talks about it and 
think the verse might be there somewhere, that, um, that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. In other words, he appears harmless. He, in fact, even appears spiritual sometimes. We need to be alert to that. Paul says we are not unaware of the, the schemes of the devil. And I'm saying that this evening because as a pastor and as a believer, I know that the root cause of so much brokenness and division and fear and shame is the work of the enemy in people's lives. Do you know one of the most common things I've found among believers is unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment? We all know about the pornography and the adultery bit, but what about this? What about those subtle things that we can so easily allow in our lives? And I want to say to you, the Bible speaks about them being sin in our lives. Sinful attitudes. Matthew chapter 6. These are the words of Jesus. He was teaching the Sermon on the Mount. And straight after the Lord's Prayer, we all know the Lord's Prayer, He says this, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Okay? But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's quite radical. Or in Matthew chapter 5, he says, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you'll remember that your brother's got something against you. In other words, this isn't you've got something against somebody. They, you're aware they've got something against you. The Bible says, leave your gift at the altar. Go and be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Now, I would like to preach a whole sermon on that verse, but let me just say this tonight. There are times when your brother will not reconcile with you. The Bible says, as far as possible, be at peace with all men. That's our responsibility. I found it so easy to, to justify our ungodly attitudes. We just blame others. What's quite sad for me as a pastor, there are so many people blaming the church for their hurts. And I think sometimes they're right. You know what's wrong is when you leave it there and you don't sort it out. And that becomes your new normal. But look at Adam and Eve's response. And I've put them on a slide because there's a threefold response that Adam and Eve have. The first thing is they cover up. You see what, what happens to Adam and Eve in verse 7, it says the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. They feel exposed. They feel vulnerable. They feel shame for the very first time in their lives. I want to ask you a question. Adam and Eve were always naked and then felt no shame. Why is it? That after they sin, they suddenly feel ashamed of their nakedness. I'll tell you why. Sin always distorts our perspective of reality. The second thing they do, they begin to blame others. It's the blame game. When God says to Adam, it's like, what have you done here? Well, this woman you gave me. It's like, comes to he comes to Eve, he says, why did you eat? He said, well, it was the serpent. And I share that with you this evening because we do the same thing. We cover up. We start blaming, well, such and such did that to me, and such and such said that to me, and look at how they've treated me. And Sometimes you've got to recognize that we make Bad choices, not because we've chosen to do wrong, but sometimes we make choice, bad choices because of what others have done to us. And then the last one, if you can pop that up, they start to hide from God. You can't ever hide from God, but they thought they could hide from God. And you know, we do very much the same. 
I've discovered what we do is we, we no longer feel comfortable in being with God. Or let me put it like this, we're no longer comfortable to be around God's people. We want to avoid God's people. You suddenly, there's a person who doesn't want to connect with you anymore, or they're not comfortable to come and worship God anymore. There's the sense of, I just can't be there anymore. We stop communicating with God. We're embarrassed to admit what we have done. There's secret sin that begins to happen. We, we no longer desire to spend time with God. And you see, that's what happened to Adam and Eve. That's the answer to the sin. Why are they behaving the way they do? Because of what happened in the garden. Because of the work of the enemy. Because they believed a lie. Probably the most difficult part of Genesis 3 to face up to are the consequences of their sin. You know what I've realized in reading Genesis 3? Adam and Eve had no clue of how bad it was going to be after they sinned. So, well, I'm just going to have some fruit. God just said, you mustn't have it. So they decided to have it. They never had a clue. They were plunging the human race into what we now see around us. We need to be aware, and I, I've certainly had to be aware again, the consequences of our choices are sometimes far more destructive than we realize. Because sin affects every area of our lives. And sin isn't just about those deliberate choices we make. Sometimes it's about those inadvertent choices we make. Like I was talking about unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment. And sadly, we have a whole generation of Christians now who don't know how to be healed from the brokenness they carry. Understanding the consequences, understanding what sin has done helps us to understand what's really happening. But there's another part of it that's so brilliant. It helps us understand what Jesus has come to do. You see, you can't understand what it means to be saved until you understand what it means to sin. When you understand the brokenness, when you understand what happened in that garden, when you understand the consequences, we begin to understand what Jesus came to do. Because tragically, when Adam and Eve sinned, they found themselves under a curse. Marriage was no longer what it was supposed to be. Childbirth becomes much more painful than it was ever meant to be. Creation is affected. Work becomes way more difficult than it's meant to be. Their relationship with God is broken, and they discover they're going to die. They're banished from the God. So Genesis says, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. And you will crawl on your belly. And you will eat dust all the days of your life. And to the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire, here's the whole marriage thing, will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and you ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. And for the first time ever in history, human beings know what it's like to live with evil. Genesis finishes like this. The Lord, Genesis 3 finishes like this. The Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. And so the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. I cannot preach a message like this without telling you the good news. Because what Genesis 3 puts back into perspective is that despite 
everything that happens, God has made a way through Jesus for us to be united to Him. Amen. Despite the curse, despite the enemy, despite their choices, Despite what happens after that, because we get into the next chapter and you discover Cain killing Abel and all of this kind of stuff, there's terrible things that begin to happen. But Jesus made a way for us to be saved. Friends, we've got to celebrate that tonight. Isn't it awesome that we can be here? And God has saved us. Wow. When we encounter the enemies in our lives, the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Do you know that? Isn't that awesome? That because of Jesus, his authority over us has been broken and the power of sin has been broken and we can resist the devil in the name of Jesus and he will flee from us. And there lies in the deception that come our way and they're going to be. I've discovered that for me. You'll discover it for you. Inadvertently, you've done, held on to things and believed some of the lies of the enemy. And when God reveals that to you or that comes to your attention, we can repent of that and that can be broken off right then and there. You know, in Christ, we have authority over the enemy. And every time we choose to obey God, Every time we choose to believe God, every time we choose to trust God, we resist the enemy. It's not rocket science. It's just about the choices that we are able to make. I want to leave you with one scripture. If we can go to the next slide, please. Next one. There we go. I want you to read, this is the ministry of Jesus that is described in Isaiah chapter 61. And Jesus in Nazareth, when in the synagogue, he takes out the scroll of Isaiah and he begins to read these words. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, that oppressed is the word for people who've been broken. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began by saying this to, the, to them. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your presence. You see, today we can say Jesus has come and Jesus has died. And Jesus has risen, and the enemy has been defeated, and that's our victory. Amen. Now, I want to finish off tonight and land this by sharing, ask, ask somebody just to share their testimony, and so I'm going to ask Michelle if she can come and join me. Can I get a mic here? I want to, I've asked her to share for a particular reason tonight. There are things that happen.